folks, we'll make a start. The uh, recording has started. It is, what is it? Tuesday the 19th of March at six o'clock. Welcome to Finance and Personnel. Stretch out. And a bit of musical chairs. <laughs> I like you, sir, David, because I can tell you off easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can reach him. <laughs> right. 755. Does anybody have any declarations of disposable pecuniary interests? None. 756. Do we have any apologies for absence? Any apology I've received since from Councillor uh, Brindle. Thank you. 757, minutes from our last meeting on the 27th of February. Are you content that they are a true record? 20th of February. Uh, 20th of February, received by four counts on the 27th of February. Happy? Yeah. 758, contracts update to note the attached schedule of contracts. We actually have some now, which is good. And Next page. As these packs get a bit, uh, bigger, Alan, I struggle to find the right value. That, that's the problem. There's a benefit of having smaller. No, tell me. Right. Uh, anything, Alan, you want to add to the four that are on there? That's the one that was approved that's planning the Guildhall Cloth Tower bids. Yeah. So we've got the current contract with the Guildhall scaffolding, the HR performance management review, the replacement of the boiler in the Guildhall, and the Guildhall Clock Tower repairs. Part of the press uh, approved a planning recently. Any questions on any of those contracts? No. Um, could we add a column for date approved? I know you've got the minute reference there and we can sure. check back, but I think it would be quite helpful to have the date approved when I was reading these. Um, and the other question I had was the replacement for the boiler. Um, where are we at with the replacement of the boiler in the guild hall? Um, if you go past down Cage Lane, you'll see that there's some earthworks outside Dad's army. That is for the new gas supply to be put in. Mm -hmm. uh, and the boiler in order. So as soon as the gas supply is in, they, they'll be there. I'm being told it's about two to three weeks. Okay. Good. I was told it started at the beginning of this week. Lovely. I was slightly nervous because we gave, well, we awarded that contract on the basis of a uh, estimate for the delivery time, and you know that factored into our approval. And I was not wanting to let it drag too long because why would we make the decision we did if it then took ages? We could have gone with somebody else, but if it's underway. Then I'm happy. Seven five nine approval of payments the usual list of uh, pay, uh, payments detailed in your pack. Uh, anything, Alan, to add to the list that was circulated? Everyone happy with the payments that are there? Yeah. Well, you made them all, so you must, be, know, you must be happy. Like <laughs> <laughs> Chief authoriser. I'm just trying to be hard to get them. That's your payment. Um, do you need a proposal and second of that to approve yeah, the payments? Yes. Could I have a proposal to accept the payments, David? And a seconder? Doug? All agreed? Yep. Thank you. Personnel report. We receive and discuss the personnel report, which was circulated in advance. Uh, I see there's been some Training courses booked up for April for the staff, fire marshal, first aid, that sort of thing, which is good. And we also give in training for the new staff that we will recruit. So we combine that with the existing staff training, so we don't have to do two separate sessions. We can actually have it as part of the induction process. Brilliant. <clears throat> and we've got a note there about planning training coming up. We got a lot of silence from Britain Council side, so. <laughs> 
I have emailed them two or three times to just follow up. They wanted to have a briefing session with me first to fully understand what the requirements were. And that seems to be a difficulty in organizing, but I have fired off an email very recently. Okay. I'm awaiting response. If you've not had a response by Friday, could you let uh, a couple of us know because we are going to Breckland for a local plan briefing. So the relevant officers will all be there and one of us could raise that for you. Sure. Um, the planning expertise, could you just outline what's been agreed there with Mark Webster in relation to planning? I think that'd be beneficial. So I'm uh, going to get a chance to do this before the meeting goes around because I was on leave and the day I arrived was the only day that I confirmed that he was actually available and was going to come. So Mark Webster used to be part of our uh, staff establishment. He used to run the planning process. Um, the feedback that I got from, uh, from councils was that they actually quite enjoyed it. He was able to do a little, a little more dimension because he, he would actually speak to the breakfast planning officers before he would have a look at the plans, etc. So I had a negotiation with, with Mark. Um, he's, I pay him a retainer um, and he will be available to do that. He, I send him all the information, he analyzes it. I put together the pack, uh, he, he adds a summary and he's more than happy to, to, to be available to discuss, and he can add a lot more depth. Uh, I have felt so embarrassed running the planning committees in the last few meetings. Uh, uh, I've really cringed, uh, um, and I don't think you, I've really done myself very proud. And I've probably spent more time preparing for that meeting than I have at any other meeting. So it's, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's money well spent. And Mark is, you know, he's, just to give you an example, he's actually going to leave for the next planning meeting and he's going to actually dial in. So I'm going to use one of these screens and actually have him on call and he'll actually do his presentation, send it to me and do it one from his hotel room. So he's really as, uh, um, you know, my understanding and just dealing with him, he will add depth to the planning processes here. Yeah, I thought it worked really well. Well done. Just need paying implications to get our money squares. I mean, I was just going to comment on that because obviously, I was here the term before, so Mark was here all along and telling us his planning. I think Mark has good value when it comes to he knows the stuff in and out, he knows the details, able to, to add, to give, give a broad view and put in these simple terms that even somebody who's not acquainted with time and can understand what, and, and give us a really good view of what's what's at stake, what's yeah. what's uh, what's to be approved and what's our limitations. And no one tried to fit the blame that those problems we struggle with. It kind of gives us the box and tells this is where you can put in that box. That's that's why you have to work with. Mark, I think was a great value, and I think it's, it was missed. And for him to come back, I think it's excellent. Planning's never worked as well, uh, other than when he was here. Yeah, the best. He it, was by far you know, the Still best. improvements, but it's still it's knowledgeable and very thorough. Yeah. So hopefully we can take uh, yeah. advantage of that and beef up our planning responses. Um, the next one on the list there, Alan, is the advertising for the two, uh, not, not two, but the new positions that we've got. And they closed uh, this week. It closed 14. 14. Yeah. Uh, all the applications on my desk. I just wanted to go through the HR consultancy tonight because they had said to me, uh, and I, this is a public meeting, but they just said, just, you know, get some feedback from the councils in terms of, of steer. So tomorrow morning, I will have a meeting with uh, Nick and we'll start running through and, and screening them. And then we'll, we'll uh, get a list and see if we can organize interviews sooner rather than later. Yeah. We had a big issue with our trade-ups on the weekend. Uh, uh, one of our staff members picked up that they were actually in a shocking state. Uh, so we had a review meeting with the contractor, but I think they realized that uh, the writing's on the wall. I think they've lost the big contract that they had, which which we were they were feeding our contract with that contract. And they just, uh, um, you know, all they could do is apologize, mm. which doesn't help us. No. Do you have any indication of how many applicants there were? Uh, I believe we could be looking at about 50. Happy birthday. Maybe it was a big one. It's actually just for the two counting positions. <laughs> and the, 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 the Zotrella Pina, what we call the Minty Officer, and the two counts. Two yeah. <laughs> They're all um, the same S SCP scale, aren't they? So. Yeah. Very similar roles. Good. Well, hopefully, amongst 
that number you've got some decent candidates that's encouraging that mm -hmm. there's that many that's a you know, good choice hopefully the the concern there is that they've just been bunted on from the job sector yeah. has not made to apply yeah well find out we'll probably different. sift them out quite quickly yeah. um okay any other questions from the personnel report no Thank you. Uh, 761 logging and reporting of complaints. There are none. Surprisingly, there are none. Carry on. You can write something. Yeah. Confidence. <laughs> <laughs> the rumor has it that I've been reported to the stairs. <laughs> You're in good company. <laughs> Uh, 762, financial report for the 11 months ended the 29th of February. Uh, that is in your pack. What are the highlights? Uh, I do enjoy your narrative band at the front of these reports. I find it really useful. Um, I think the narrative, as the year goes on, the narrative kind of is becomes really repetitive. Um, um, you know, we, we've got problems in in our uh, in the venues and markets from an income perspective. There was there was an over budgeting there. Mm. Our cemetery income is down, which is which uh, is just due to the mix. Uh, for the last two years, we haven't actually hit the target. Normally, you know, we have to turn people away from from being buried in the park. Let's do that. Uh, our other income is up because we book costs for projects. Um, and our, surprisingly, our, our property income is up. You know, we, 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 we've still got two unsold units of the shambles. Um, so that's that's been quite surprising. On the finance and personnel perspective, uh, uh, we've got significant savings there. From an expenditure perspective, a lot of that is salaries. Um, um, we've changed the way that we budget, so hopefully we, we won't have that. So the other part of, of that saving is when we did the budget for finance and personnel, Electricity, gas, oil prices were at the highest. It was in November 2022. Uh, so we have huge savings in, in those particular areas. So just the three areas of that. Unfortunately, our trade, we've signed a new contract with Brecon Council for our trade waste, waste disposal. But the, we are generating so many skips at the moment that the savings that we're having from doing that, we're actually losing because we're paying huge amounts to have our skips emptied. So we're doing an investigation into that. We, we're going into the markets. We, we, there's no way that we just go to one supply and say, please drop off the skip. But one of the issues that we have to do is we have to think about our allotments because that's where a lot of the, the, the waste is being generated. As we clear allotments, we have to do that. Uh, when we get, just uh, as an aside, when we get, con we're going out and getting contractors to clear allotment sites, their biggest cost is waste disposal, it's just getting rid of it. So we're having a rethink of that. I've issued instruction that I want to see a quote, a competitive quote for every single skip that gets used. And we need to just make sure we're aware of what we're actually putting into it. Mm. Whether we can compost some of the stuff ourselves, mm. I'm, 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 you know, we, need, we need to have a look at. Mm. Uh, venues and markets is, uh, 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 is over expenditure. Um, that's really repairs and maintenance. Uh, I think some projects were undertaken that, that the budget wasn't there. Um, um, and because you'd expect with income being lower, that you'd expect the expenditure to be lower because it's a commercial type uh, organization. And amenities is, is, is lower. We've had we budgeted an extra nineteen thousand pounds worth of cost because of all the the, the, the uh, land clearing that we've done, we've caught up backlog on uh right across common. And we discovered that our that our contractor had done work and hadn't invoiced us going back. So we've got about twenty-one thousand pounds of invoices that we've processed in the last uh, month. Uh, they've all been verified, they've all been signed off, but they actually just were uh, delayed in doing the extra work. So they've been, it's not their contractual work, mm -hmm. that's been booked every single month, but it's all the scrapes and the other work that they've been doing on Brian and Cross Common, and those costs have come through. And then our other expenditure relates to um, the projects. We've earned project, uh, grant income and project income, and those are the costs related, related to that. We're not ripping off people, just for the record, because there's timing costs. We recurred higher cost last year, lower income this year. We have higher income and lower costs. So the Barnum Cross Common, the work that was done on there, was it um, not budgeted for? Who agreed it? Who decided it needed doing? Um, what they do, did is they had certain um, um, 
we agreed that they would do certain work. So it wasn't part of the normal contract. Yeah. We said that they'd have to do certain scrapes in order for us to keep our SSI or meet our obligations in terms of that. But was it agreed that we have to do that? It, was, it, it was agreed. And what, what had happened it. is because of the change of management, no one had changed up the invoices. And our supplier also has had significant changes. I mean, yeah. all the contractors that we've been working with. So when, when they, we, we said to them, have you done, why haven't you done your work? And they said, well, we actually have done it. And then that's when the bill right. got produced. Yeah. So it was us doing it rather than then them saying, you know, we haven't bills. It was why haven't you done your work? Yeah. You bring our SSI money at risk. Um, it's a recurring issue, particularly when we look at this agenda item each month, where the council is having to chase contractors for invoices. Mm -hmm. And I would have thought that there would have been a time limit put in place of how long people could invoice us, because it doesn't help us with proper sort of budget management. Mm -hmm. But there, but if, if, there isn't. Yeah, yeah, because, you know... Six years. Six years? Yes. Yeah. Six years. I think it'd be 30 days or something. Yeah, right? no, it's six years. Six, six years. years. It's six years. Really? How long can change the Sign it off in a month or it's never going to get in. So, presumably, I know we're talking about financial regs later and purchase ordering process. Presumably, we're able to track these um, late invoices against purchase orders and that sort of thing. Uh, we have a process. My assistant is brilliant at doing that. Uh, we use a kind of coding system so I can go onto a spreadsheet and just look okay. down that and see that. The problem that we have is that the ordering system is not as robust as it should be. Yeah. So if, if I if I use two spheres of government, if I go to Beckham Council and, and ask for some work, they'll send me a PO number. That means nothing to me. You know, it doesn't tell me what, what work they want, what the what the what the price uh, uh, is. If we do work for Norfolk County Council, for example, we get a proper purchase order. This is yeah. this is where you build, this is this is the description of the work, this is where you send your invoice to. So we're trying to move to that. Unfortunately, uh, I couldn't get that implemented. I've been trying for years to have it implemented. If you go back to finance reports years ago, you'll see that it was there. So now that I ha I'm in the opportunity to do that, we I, it, it's going to start on the 1st of April. Yeah. We are not having this. And I, I was explaining to the SMT that if they had to come and write these reports to see all these variances and why they've occurred, it's actually, it, it is an element of poor budgetary control. Yes. We're just lucky that we that we underspending in some areas yes. uh, to counter the overspending in other areas. And we can't continue like that. So I'm really trying to address that. Thank you. And yeah. can do from Yeah, I think it's really way. important. If we go down the purchase order route, even if we haven't physically received the invoice, you should then, from a budgetary point of view, anticipate it at some yeah. point so the budget is more accurate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Double entry bookkeeping. <laughs> well, we, it's just a, a recurring issue where we've heard on multiple occasions, whether it's a cemetery or amenities, oh, we've had some invoices come in for work that was done six months. Okay. You'd think these firms have cash flow <laughs> requirements, but you know. Um, I just wanted to ask about waste disposal costs, and I see the figure there of £6,000. I was interested, you said that um, uh, there has been some additional costs. Um, the original overspend was a lot higher than that, if I remember right. Yeah. So the fact that we've bought in this new contract, um, I don't know if we've done a calculation of how much we've saved um, over the year, but I'd imagine it's quite significant because um, we were already, it was over 10 grand, the overspend, four months ago. I think it's been uh, quite significant. I think for, if I look at the two contracts, one was about 1,000 one was sorry, 900 and the other one was 1,200. Uh, the last invoices uh, we paid them the other day uh, was 300 and 600. Okay. So it is quite a substantial okay. thank, thank goodness we put that in place because I, I was really worried at one point that the yearly overspend for waste disposal would be over 20,000 pounds. That was the trajectory. But because that new contract has been put in place, it's actually, although we're now incurring some additional costs, it's nowhere near as bad as it would have been. Um, I noticed there's uh, an eighteen thousand pound variance on um, on the uh, guild hall um, relating to the tea room. Um, I'm a bit sort of um, puzzled because I can't. I assume the, that that's that's obviously because it's not open, but I can't see a corresponding um, uh, amount of money on the on the other side on the on the expenditure. So um, it. it is that actually a loss, or, or or is it offset by not having to buy anything? That figure is, that, is there a code link to that figure? Um, it'll be five, two, some. Yeah, um, hang on. Um, I 
find it now, can I? Uh, I'll find it for you. It's on the second page. It is uh, 4206. 5, 5Q10. Oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. Catering purchases. Well, the no, one I wanted to look at was 4206, which is Guildhall Catering. Um, yeah. That's on income. It says it's 18,000 live. So the income is down by 18, and yeah. the, 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 the purchases are down by 4,700. So okay. our GP percent on catering was a lot higher. It was about 60 to 70 okay. percent. So if you lose, uh, you know, uh, um, 100 pounds in sales, you only lose 30 pounds in, yeah, yeah. in, in purchases. Yeah. So, so that's why the, okay. the, the conversation. But we weren't, we weren't losing money on it. Weren't we? if, you had, if you took the salaries out of, out of the salaries line budget yeah. and allocated it to all the various line items, we were paying to have that team of open. So, so having it closed has actually been a benefit financially. Yes. Yes. And then, Although we're still paying the salaries, I guess. No, no, the salaries, we, we reallocated the salaries. Which did, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So what's the, sorry, Doug. Oh, sorry, I was going to move on to something else. I thought you were moving on. No, 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 I've, I've got a different point. I'm just going to have a very granular point on the waste thing. You say a lot of it's doing skips and um, allotments. Is it just a practical reason why we can't um, allocate some of the cost there? Because it, I, I don't know, I just looked at the budget line and I go, oh, allotments, yeah. That's pretty much on budget. That if we're incurring lots of cost and allotments, and they're actually costing us money, then I feel like we need there's to... quite a lot of corporate costs that are hidden. The same with amenities. Some of the skips will be for amenities, but they they come under finance and personnel because that's the sort of corporate waste disposal. Yeah. But, you know. Yeah. So the issue was, if you don't mind, it was we used to have about one thousand two hundred codes, and yeah. we had insurance in every single. Part. So we took certain costs and we, we broke them up and we allocated them. So the accounting was just doing general entries and reallocation. They then they then narrowed them right down. But I think what we've put done is to go from one extreme to, to the other extreme yeah. and it's moving back to the middle ground. And I'm determined, I have my own personal development project as part of finance, is to get more functional uh, budgets because we need to understand that otherwise we look at allotments and we don't understand what the true cost is. So therefore, yeah, yeah. the driver to look at deposits, the driver to look at increasing allotment fees is not there. So we will get there, but it's just... Yeah, that makes sense. I um, I'm aware it's one of those things. It's very hard to manage, but it's, um, don't want to create too much work, but at the same time, it just seems sort of hard sometimes to when you look at it. Is, is the cost of clearing allotments, is that something we expect to reduce over time? Mm, you'd hope so. I think it was... So I think it's very good. We looked at I looked at this before, and it's not passed on. It's a hidden cost. Uh, all the time, it's a hidden cost. You know, the cost of clearing the allotment is more than the yearly charge oh, yeah. for that allotment. I think that if you do eventually look into it and have all the costs associated with the allotments, but what I'm asking is, will that cost the? You know, I, I, I'm assuming. But once you've cleared an allotment, you don't have to clear it again. Mm. So what, what I'm asking is, really, over time, do we expect that cost to, di to diminish? I, I think on a, we, we've got some special uh, uh, clearings that we have to do, but we're going to use external contractors for that, so, so that, won't, that won't come to our cost. Yeah. Why, it is about, why it has been high is that we've actually been using a very thorough uh, or a far more robust inspection regime. So we've actually had people leave. And one of the reasons that they leave is because they have too much stuff on the allotments or they're not using the allotments, so they use this storage. So I think we are making inroads into that. So when the tail when it will reduce, you know, whether it's 12 months or 24 months, I'm not too sure. But I think it's very road as the sites of, you know, very road is, is in virtually immaculate, I would, I would say. Okay, good. London Road is, you know, if, if people have to leave London Road, I think we, um, you know, there's more timber in London, in London Road than I think there is in Tepid Forest. <laughs> I, I wonder if this is something we can load on to the actual tenants in time, because we're, we're paying for their yeah. prestige, really, aren't we? I mean, this, this is probably... This is probably from Chris and myself at uh, a lot of this committee. I don't know. The deposit system is what we need to look at. The, the cost of the deposit should be sufficient to clear the plot. Yeah. That's why we hold a deposit. Yeah. yeah. And it's, how much is it now? 50 quid? 50 quid for a half. Well, 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 I'd, I'd rather leave me plot and sod off because yeah. you know, and keep the 50 quid. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. And the costs. With the increasing cost of this person going half. I was just, I mean, 
I, I skipped not long ago. It cost me an arm and a leg. Yes. <laughs> it, is, it is a costly uh, part of the aspect of keeping things tidy. Uh, and it keeps improving very much so every year on the first time. So even those 50 pounds, even if it's stationary, so it's going to come a point where you can get so I have to cover the cost of wearing the guns and we run a 12 percent. I do think it's a, a good thing that clocks are being cleared, though. Yeah, um, so we need to remember that. And, you know, there's a bit of pain in the short term, but I do hope Terry's point is right, that it will get better yeah. uh, in the sense of there won't be as, as a need for as many. There's, there's a backlog we're clearing. Once it's cleared, there shouldn't be that many frequencies. There's so much asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, can you just confirm what the headline figures are? Because we're almost at the end of the year now, aren't we? Um, this is, this is where I give the most nervous ever in producing these reports because I, oh, I, I, hope, I hope nothing didn't seem uh, read back. At the moment, we're sitting with a net total of about 46, 709. Uh, but it's before it's before financial year end. So I've got to do value. I, we've got a lot of work to do uh, in April, May, where we've got to check the prepayments. We've got to check what's uh, uh, what we haven't accrued. So I, I think it, it'll come out well. Uh, um, so we're not going to have a deficit, I'm fairly certain of that. What that surf, final surface will be, I'm not sure. We've also got to provide for things like the um, um, HR consultancy, for example, we haven't provided for that, and the participatory budgeting hasn't been provided for. I think we set aside £19,000 for amenities, additional land claim. I think some of those costs have not come through. Uh, the 25000 that we set aside for participatory budgeting is uh, might, might still have to come out of this year okay. in, in a different way. So fingers crossed, we'll be okay. I'm fairly confident. But we're, not, we're not making we're not like tons of money. <laughs> well, a surplus is always better than a deficit. Mm -hmm. Any other questions on the 11-month report? Yeah, happy to note. Uh, can I just ask a question 5138 green energy saving projects we're not planning any and we're not going to spend any money this year will that be back in the budget for next year if, if it's not spent and was there any element of energy efficiency or green energy saving in the new boiler or any consideration for that it will be that, that line item was we actually did a whole lot of small projects that we changed the, the lighting system in the guild hall. Right. So that column is actually last year's expenditure. It's not yeah. this year's expenditure. We didn't yeah. budget anything for this year. But we hadn't done it. So hopefully it comes That's only because it was spent the previous year. The, the actual projects. Yeah. Hopefully the same comes through lower electricity costs, lower uh, okay. uh, energy costs. We did the roof of the uh, part of the Carnegie. So that hopefully our heating bills were there. So so the end result of that is sitting copious and the other parts of the budget. Our biggest challenge is we don't we, we don't have spark meters and yeah. that's not true lack of trying because that would actually help us quantify what those settings are. But we've uh, saved a fortune on heating in the guild hall. <laughs> <laughs> we have, yeah. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> Extra jumper, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, we'll move on to 763, which is the draft <laughs> budget. Uh, this has been to a few committees for comments, so thank you to uh, everybody that's contributed. I think it's missed venues, Terry, because obviously we're meeting tonight and you're meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a live document, so there's always an opportunity to uh, amend it. Um, and we've sort of tidied up the list of projects a little bit, Alan, haven't we? Do you want to sort of highlight which ones we've um, confirmed as still being re required? Uh, in terms of the, all, all of these, I haven't done a report on the on the uh, status of the current one because that's where I, okay. you asked me, and I'll do that uh, when we report back on that for next year because sorry next month because I have to actually get that for the reserves also. So this is only projects going forward. Okay. I've just taken a view of what what I what I'm fairly certain is not going to be completed by the 31st of March. Yeah. Um. Um. And and then this this budget, but in the previous meeting I had a the current status of the current year budget, yep. and that I need to do more work uh, okay. on, and we'll do that through, this, through the financial year range process. Okay. 
Um, the one I wanted to, well, there's two I want to comment. One is the play part renewal of £40,000. So previously that was spread over two years, £40,000 each year. I know we did the first year's worth of play area repairs to forty grand. Is that forty grand the second year, or is that an additional forty to the eighty? It's the third year. So it's a, a third. So it's another forty on top of the eighty. Yeah. Ooh. That's a lot of money. Yeah. It is. And is that based on because we had some fairly detailed ROSPA reports and quotes to basically fulfil the ROSPA requirements? Is that one hundred and twenty figure based on working through the recommendations? It is. Um, Okay. Is that but, but, sorry. Is that predominantly Castle Park? I know we've no, got a few. No, no, no. Where, are, where are the yeah. biggest castles? That's probably the best one out of the 30. Yeah. Uh, we've had to do receding at Fairfields. Um, we've done, uh, we had a, a, a space of vandalism, uh, and we're just renewing where things break. We have to, you know, uh, they get inspected weekly by us and annually by us right. through Rosper. So it's just a matter of just keeping on top of it. But I think we I think we have to the corner. So this 40,000 could be used to upgrade rather than repair. Uh, uh, and that might, you know, at some stage the amenities committee was thinking about, well, can we have a program to upgrade some of the, the play parks? Because they really are quite redundant, you know, old and redundant. Uh, this 40,000 hopefully will be able to be used for that rather than right. doing routine repairs. I think that's good to highlight that it's it's refurbishment and improvement rather than yeah. constant repair. I don't see your permission to talk. No. You said a bad example. <laughs> in, in, in the operational budget, we've actually had also increased significantly the amount of money that we spent on repairs for play pop. We doubled so, it. Yeah. Right. So that's a very good argument for not having any more play parks, isn't it? <laughs> Um, I mean, how do people feel about spending yet another 40k on play parks? I mean, on top of the 80 we've already spent. It seems a huge amount of money. Yeah. Is, I haven't worked out what it is, but I still think there needs to be an alternative. I don't think I feel like play parks are seen as the thing you do because they've done, yeah, they're really in use. What for kids six months a year? I mean, where we live, we technically live close to one on our COVID estate. We only really go to Castle Park because we only, you know, it's not actually that much difference. We're going into town, we're going to use that pile of park. So I actually, I, I do feel like at some point we can consider how we invest that money more effectively. I'm saying I'm just, I haven't got an answer, but I think it'd be rather nice to to do, if not a consultation as such, to put in like a bout set or something to say, look, this is what the cost is. Could people let us have their opinions? Because when we're out canvassing and talking to people, the things that do come up is a lack of amenity for young children. Yeah. And then we say, well, actually, we've got play parks. Do you know they cost us 40 grand a year? Well, let's talk about it, put it out, and let people come back to us. Mm. We've got this wonderful website that's nearly working. You know, it's great <laughs> to put something on there. Oh, it's a <laughs> bit. And say, and say, come on, let's, let's have some feedback. Okay, thank you. Can I, uh, Terry, Chris, then Ron. Um, what, is there a case for having fewer play parks, but of better quality? That would be my view. Okay. Um, oh, right. Okay. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I've had this discussion with with a councillor who's not on here anymore, and he wanted to do away with some of the play parks, mm -hmm. which I thought was really wrong. I would increase the number of play parks we have. If we need one on the Norwich Road estate. Yep. We need one. We need the one at Elm Road, modernising and brought up to date. So I'm all for that. I mean, if, the more play parks we have, the better. We keep on about children's health, how we're fed up with being stuck indoors. Let's give them the facilities to get outside and do something. Okay. I just wanted to know whether the exercise park is part of that package. So things like that, I think, are worth exploring, integrating exercise in, in especially for all ages, not just the toddlers. You mean the one at Castle Pub? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's always used. It's brilliant. Yeah. Uh, Annie then Doug. Um, 
just on the um the cost of the play parks is it possible because you were saying that some of that money the forty thousand, is used to prevent to repair vandalism when people complain what on the play parks can't we just say actually we we spend this much money on repairing vandalism if that didn't happen mm -hmm we would have more money to spend on them. Just to let people know, because everybody, you know, just to say we've got 40,000, I don't think people think that some of that is being used to repair vandalism. I think That's, from memory, uh, I don't this financial year is about £10,000 on repairs specifically for vandalism. Well, that's quite a lot, That's isn't it? it? To yeah. let people know, because that would mean, OK, there's £30,000 to uh, Play parts, <coughs> which is yeah. a lot less. So, I'm over the three. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, apologies. Uh, I think I was just shooting daggers at you. Now, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was just going to respond to Chris's point. I'm, I, I, to me, I don't think it's about, and I'm less basically using other councils because I have kids and I want them to have fun and stuff to do. So, yes, I want activities for kids, I want them to have places to go out there, help me when they can do things. I don't think that necessarily correlates directly to a play park. You know, there's lots of other facilities we get yeah. with that kind of money that might be better. We could coach them into different sports. We could do that. I, I, I feel like the money there. I, I worry that it's just it's going to be spent on play parks because we just always spend it on play parks rather than thinking how we can actually do more for children to keep them active. Oh, we used to have youth clubs, but we don't anymore. Oh, don't man, Terry. Sorry. Everyone loves play parks. Yes. <laughs> I, I, no, it's all right. I... <laughs> <laughs> Go. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm i not in committee, I'm just giving my opinion, but I think play parks is a double edged sword. You know, it's the cost, is it so different? But the benefit to the community from our perspective is, is a bridge failure. And I think the community wouldn't see it well if we're done away with parks all completely by any means. So I agree with Chris on that respect. I'm not sure we need to have so many um, or if we need to increase them given the cost they have, to be honest, Chris. But I think at least make the ones we have in quality and necessary for the children are absolutely essential so they have a place to play. But I remind you as well that on the last meeting, a minute, because we voted in something called everybody has the right to play. So we can't really contradict ourselves as a, as a council. So we sign up and we all unanimously agree to, to promote that as a core principle and then do away with the play parks. I just think it's a bit conflictive if we go that way. But I think there's got to be some stress we have really found that to invest their money a bit more wisely. The safety comes first, and then how we upgrade it and in which, to which by which pace we do that, maybe something that needs to be discussed a bit further. Um, can I make a suggestion, Anna, as a bit of an action point? Um, could you or maybe Mark make contact with um, Breckland about what section 106 contributions that we've got available for play. Because I think the point Ron made about the gym equipment, we didn't pay for that as a town council. We coordinate, coordinated that, but it was section 106 contribution for okay. 40 odd grand. Um, so if there is any money available, it can't be used for repairs, but the point you made about actually we're now in the realms of upgrade. So section 106 is relevant because we're improving, not just maintaining the current standards. So it'd be worth looking at section 106 contributions um and what was the other point i was going to make um 40 40 i can't remember if i may tell you very quickly as part of that that uh, proposal that was approved by us um one of the main points that was quite uh, enforced it was the ability of spaces that are adaptable that's ability friendly that come can accommodate all different um, members of, uh, mm -hmm. of the community. And this is something that was, was clear from that last meeting that we were lacking, was a, a facility that could accommodate people with disabilities, multiple nothing, neurodivergence, or whatever the situation yeah. may be. So it might, it might be that we have to invest in the play parks, but maybe a, a find a strategy or where the priorities are and try to accommodate so it is accessible for everybody in the community. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I'd echo that. It feels yeah. um, like we're just uh, just sort of jogging along rather than thinking about what we're doing. Yeah, I, I, think, I think there may be a case for a, some sort of strategy. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing the word working party, new me into being. Oh, no, no, I'm just <laughs> I think it's something we can take forward through immunities. We need a play area plan. Yeah. 
So I'm sensing we're happy to keep the 40k in there for play areas. I think for now, <laughs> you're going to want to. I don't know, it's up to you guys. I'm just. Mm-hmm. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> um, and the 20 grand that we've got as the project budget for the sculpture trail, well, how much of that is donor money and how much is that is our own money? Um, big 10,000 of it is our money. Okay. So we've received money, and we will receive money from BFER and must be Breckland. I, I, I try to remember. I think it was MTI. And, okay, so we're happy to continue to deliver the sculpture trail. Um, can, can I ask? I've never heard anything about this. Where is it and what is it? It's been on the back burner for a long while. So it's basically put in place the sculpture trail primarily along the river mm-hmm. um, and basically creating circular walks within Fetford, mm-hmm. uh, encompassing the river and Barn and Common, places like that. And there will be uh, some uh, wood sculptures, some metal sculptures, that sort of thing. Um, so it's a nice project. It's about getting people oh, for that walking. Um, uh, as Doug was saying about, you know, not necessarily play equipment, but stuff for families to do and there'll be a little trail guide and that sort of thing. I think we do get hijacked into thinking that, and I think this is reinforcing Doug's point, that the only form of play is a play park. Mm. You, you know, we can be more creative. Okay. Yeah, um, that's more, all sorts of things like that. Yeah, done. absolutely. Yeah. The restoring King's House Council Chamber and the removal costs, I mean, combined, that's £10,000. That's quite a lot of money, isn't it? We have quotes, uh, the highest quote we got for sorting out this wall, for example, is only £2,000. Okay. But, but we don't know what's behind it. So I've just been, we don't have to spend, because it's budgeted, we don't have to spend it. That's the point, I, you know, it's, it's like pay box. This committee, or the amenities committee, will have to make a formal decision on all these projects. This is just mm-hmm. to ensure that we've actually worked out where it is. So if we don't incur it, we, we don't need it. But I hate to have a situation where, you know, if something needs that needs doing it, we don't have a budget to do it, then we're going to have to do environments and do everything. We can't do it necessarily a little bit more formally. Okay. Does the does the budget include the archiving and removal of the um, records in the locals in the asset? Uh, some of the archiving costs have been really incurred, uh, uh, and that would be an operational cost. We haven't we haven't budgeted with that in the project's budget. Because okay. I understand there's a lot there. And the books have really gone. So, All right, okay. so, so, so there's two, there were two mixes of the standing forces way ahead of where the Fifth Attack Council is. The books are in a specially, special room at Simon Long. Okay. Long. Okay. So they'll be ongoing storage costs as well. But they're not as, it's, they're actually quite reasonable. Yeah. But that's a standing force. Uh, yeah, okay. Mm-hmm. Is there, they're committed to the post. Okay. Uh, sorry, Carla. Yeah. It's just a quick question. Can I, how's what asking? The same that we're going to incur on the longer term by moving from here to Cali, which was the whole plan initially to save costs for the council, will not the cost of the whole moving over time dissipate? I mean, it is a cash flow issue, but will they not so dissipate in savings that we're going to gain long term with that? Other? Isn't that the strategy? If, I'm, if I understood well, basically. Yeah. Okay. These costs are one off costs. Yeah, well, yes. The problem is they're all one off now. <laughs> These particular years, I see that issue. Mm-hmm. There were two things I added, um, took the liberty of adding. One, one is the uh, Thomas Paine Plinth. Uh, so we've added 10,000. I'm still waiting for the, the quotes. So that if it's 10,000, we could we can possibly afford it. And the other one is because we didn't have a venue as a market meeting until tomorrow night, I just went and did some um, inquiries. And you'll see right at the bottom there, there's the uh, fifth, fifth one from the bottom marketplace sounds. Just, sorry. Uh, the Carnegie speakers, the one above that, uh, they believe that the speakers need to be replaced. So I've just put in the budget that has to be confirmed by a big market. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I think we've probably commented on that enough. Um, I'm quite keen for it not to go to full council at the moment. I think it needs a bit more work done just to review some of the costs. Um, I'm quite keen that we identify where these, this money is coming from uh, on each aspect. Um, well, okay. Hold on. That there, you can be the page below. Yeah. 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 
Can I ask one question about that? Just so I understand it, and this is, I feel like I've asked this question before. General reserve, which fund is that, and why is there 120,000 mark against it for the next financial year? Um, the general reserve is just, it's the, it's contingency. Yeah. And the 120,000 would possibly be the 75,000 for the fire risk assessment projects. Um, and the parish partnership of 25,000 would be the main one thing. And the, um, just on the fact that the, 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 the fire um, thing starts at what cost it will be, it won't take place for the net. We don't need to do it. And it's not. No, no, it's just a one of the costs. And how long would that last for? Roughly? Well, we're hoping that it will keep us. We, we'd be very careful and diligent, I'd like to think this time. We're actually appointing a project manager before we do anything else. Uh, uh, we've got fire specialists that's going to come in. We've got quotes uh, from three suppliers. They, they come out at about 75,000 pounds. We don't believe that, that's, that we should be incurring that type of cost. So what we're doing is we're getting the project manager to actually break it all down into various tasks and then do them as small assignments. So for example, putting in the fire doors where they need to be put in, that would be one task. And they will then go and they with all three suppliers uh, and actually make a recommendation to say, well, this is what we need to do. But we will bring a plan to finance the personnel once that's done uh, with, from the project manager so that we can actually, is, there's an accountability and transparency over that. Cool. Thanks. Okay. We can do something right at the time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> On the, sorry, yeah. on the fire thing, we've got to incur a lot of costs here that we're not going to incur in future. So that's going to be a significant save. One of the bonuses of moving from here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what, what we're essentially saying we're going to do if we drop, adopt this um, schedule of projects is spend £300,000 of reserves in the next year, which is a pretty major decision. And I think we just need to pause for a moment and make sure that we're happy with that. I mean, it's pretty, you know, almost a third of our total reserves in the next financial year. And I'd, I'd rather we went through the projects in a bit more detail before we commit to that. Oh, I'm a bit quiet. <laughs> <laughs> because of some of the things we're putting in place, it's hitting the reserves this year. Yeah. One of the major costs is the two towers, yeah. which is fine. But and the heating. And the heating. So that's like well, that's a one-off cost. Those things. But next year a lot of our income is going down because of the steps we're taking now. Our expenditure is not going to be so high on expenditure. Expenditure's going down. Expenditure's going down. Yeah. Expenditure's going down. Yeah. Expenditure's going down. Yeah. Expenditure's going down. So over the next two or three years, we will be putting a significant chunk of that reserves back that we've drained out this year. In theory. Uh, of course, sort of theory. There's always more expenditure. Mm. <laughs> I, think, I think the trouble with that argument, David, is that there are some people who always want to spend money. Yeah. I know, I know. I, I can't believe it. <laughs> oh, dear. I think what I would like to do is to look through the reserves um and the project list um and then come back with a proposal next month if you're happy with that we, we do the financial year end at in may yeah. it might be worthwhile to actually combine them because we have to do a schedule with that and then you'll then know exactly what your reserves are that. and then we can actually plan going forward okay and that's intensive uh, um with them with the scaffolding and those flaming towers we are incurring a weekly cost of a thousand is it possible to at least have that scheduled in because if we're putting it back another 10 weeks to, to may or june that's another 10 or 15 no, no, that, that, that decision's already been made a, this is so this is separate this by delaying it won't impact that. anything um that's already underway because it's already been agreed to mm -hmm. so okay. the heating and the scaffolding and the two towers nothing's been delayed so, this will fine. progress. Fine. This essentially is um, uh, new projects. Right, that's fine. And with the best will in the world, I doubt any of the new projects will be started by May anyway, because we've got quite a few big ones on the go as it is. Fine. 
Okay, uh, so I'm going to leave it there. And I think coming back in May, once we've got the first four years accounts and an up-to-date um, report on reserves, and then we can take stock for the year ahead. 764, internal control review, to review and update the template for internal control review that is required by legislation and is referred to in our financial regulations. So what we're trying to do, like we're saying that we used to do internal control reviews and a lot of councils do them, and I don't think they really understand why they do them and what the purpose is. So I spend a lot of time developing this particular module. If you, if you, if you get the uh, presentation the right place. Uh, in May or June, whenever it happens, we will be coming to the council and, and, and asking the council to agree all these steps. Can you check, you know, do you, is council happy that step one, step two, instrument control objectives three, four, five, six, et cetera, are, can be ticked off? And previously, it was, there, was, there was really nothing to have the basis. And what we did is we took that and we said, okay, if we're going to ask council to do that, we actually need to do an internal control review that actually enables each of those assertions that you could actually say, yes, we can sign that off because these are the controls that we have in place. And so what we've done is we've developed this, this template. It's worked fairly well for the last two, two years. So this will be the third year that we actually use it. And all it requires is, is, is if this committee is happy, for these assertions, for the internal control review to contain this, the committee can elect councillors to do the internal control review. The idea is that you interrogate me as, as town clerk and, and finance officer and, and get the assurance that what we say we're doing is adequate. And what I've done is you, the highlights in yellow are changes that have happened recently that probably still need to be tested a little bit more so that we can um, um, councils can get the assurance that those are the things that we're focusing on. So some of the issues that have come out in previous internal control reviews is if controls over credit cards, uh, uh, there was a loss of control at, at some stage over that, that's been rectified. The ordering system needs attention, we've highlighted that, and there's some other the, some other factors. So it's a little bit of a, a kind of governance model, but I believe if, if the council would ever ask, how did you make that decision, they would actually use this as a basis of justifying that. David? Um, I like that, but the yes box, which yes, I'd like your signature in it, for example, and the, the mayor or the, the leader of the financing person, like two signatures saying it's been done and they're satisfied with that. That table was a nationally supplied document, isn't it? Yeah. The one that's yes, no, that's the same table for all parish and town councils. Yeah. But it's um, and the full version, there is a bit at the bottom, and I think it's the chair of the full council that has to sign it, isn't it? Uh, it's the chair of the council. That'll do. That's the time part. Yeah. So that's just a amended version yeah. of the questions. Once it's approved by full council, once it's been completed, the mayor signs it on behalf of the council. Fine. Yeah. Looks looks excellent. Yeah. Um. So the nominate councillors to undertake the review, in the past, I've always felt that it's best to have two councillors who are not members of the finance committee to do it. Um, uh, and funny enough, Carla, um, although you are here this evening, um, you're not a member of finance and personal. I've done the table now. <laughs> and I did wonder if, it's, obviously, you've got a, a sort of legal background, and I know you're very good at interrogating things. Um, Craig, is so that a compliment? That, that is a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying okay, yeah. okay, I'm okay, told I'm very good at compliments. Um, <laughs> oh dear. I, I thought about yourself and then Stuart Wright, so, you know, he's a child accountant and he's not on finance and personnel. And I thought That's the right. two of you would actually be quite good for this. <laughs> That's fine. I, um, I don't mind. And I'm not in finance, so they even... Yeah. Why not? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Else, I guess is fine. Do yes, you want to have someone else in addition to those two, or just with those two? Yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, choose enough. Oh, yeah. This is something to feed back to the committee. I'll, I'll take a minute. I think it'd be good for you to do. There's a sort of experience. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Good evening. 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 Uh, I'm happy to propose those three. Would somebody like to second? 
Ron? All agreed? Thank you very much for volunteering. <laughs> Anything else on internal control review? <laughs> so Alan will be in touch with you both from the set up. Okay, um, that's all right, yeah. And that's right, as part of that, have a look at previous versions as well, because this is something we do every year. Yeah, like um, but it will be particularly useful, I think, probably for you, Terry, as a new councillor to actually maybe ask questions that mm. you haven't been asked before. Yeah. Yeah, useful. So it's a good good balance then. <laughs> 765, financial risk assessment to review the financial risk assessment that was distributed to committee members and published with this agenda on the website. When's the last time we reviewed the financial risk assessment? They get reviewed every year. Oh. I don't review it. I talk about this all the qualification. <laughs> if I give you a little bit of history, I think I think this has gone through quite a rigorous process. Uh, every year we, we find it. But I think the one mistake that we possibly made uh, last year is we put too many things into the financial risk assessment and not put it, put it into the financial risk into the financial regulations. So I've tried not to make that mistake uh, uh, this year. You know, things like our project management, you know, we've addressed that in the financial regulations because we actually need project management. I think those committees we are in the committee officer, you've heard me say that uh, so often. Um, and there's other changes that we've uh, done that I've recommended we put it to the financial regulations because then it's a more of a live process because as officers, we, go, we review the financial regulations far more often than we would review the financial risk assessment. But this is a, it's it's a, it's an evolving document. I I was quite surprised at how many mistakes I found. The last was one, and the last year I was even, you know, the minutes of the corresponding meeting were about that long because we had all the queries that we had missed. Then it is evolving. I think it does address uh, uh, um, the risks. Our risk environment hasn't changed very much from the last two or three years, uh, so I have kept it. And in some of the cases, our risk, about, our understanding of risk has actually improved. So I'll use an example when we had the SUE, we, we didn't, we didn't, we thought that we were actually assuming responsibilities without, without necessarily uh, um, accruing income or generating in, in, income from it. It's actually turned out to be the opposite way around. We're generating income, but we've actually haven't assumed very many responsibilities there. So that changes the risk profile of that particular item. And um, when I went through it, the first thing I saw was lots of green, <laughs> which is always a good sign. Um, and I'm always drawn to the red. There was a bit in here about uh, e-commerce. Um, failure to access, uh, failure to maintain access to council online accounts. With the increased use of e-commerce, council accounts are being opened in personal names rather than using titles. When staff leave, access to accounts is restricted or denied. New account opening protocols have been developed to mitigate this risk. So that deals with any new accounts that are opened. Is there a process of going back through any that are already currently there and changing them as well? We, we are doing that. We have to do that. Otherwise, we just lose access to our accounts. Yeah. So I had last year, for example, I, I think it was eight months, I couldn't access our water accounts. Uh, so it took ages to be able to do that. So we're very strict in doing that. And what we've done as part of our protocol is that we, instead of, you know, I use the, the, the email address town clerk at Deptford Town Council rather than Alan York at Deptford Town Council. And all the other managers and staff have, are associated with with a department rather than with, a, with their own personal name. But if there's so many accounts that you keep discovering them, not, you know, often, but we are doing it because if we don't do it now, you know, we'll be at a stage where we can't do anything. Would it be good practice to have the same, say, three names on every account that you find? So as, so as you know, you're sort of future proofing, so, so you know who's on the, which names are on it, rather than having, you know, Joe Blogs or whoever. We, we try to do that, so but unfortunately, in some cases, you can only have one administrator. So, so okay, okay, so, yeah. So, so, but we do try to do that as a general rule because that you know, if something happens to me in the hospital for you know four months, you know, someone needs to still the business, the, the, the cost still operates. So, we have to address that uh, issue and we try. But I have one, for example, on Sage, I can't add other people to the, to the account, unfortunately. Yeah. 
In some organisations where I've worked before, the, the head of the organisation has a list of everybody's passwords and stuff like that. Uh, anyway, I mean, where do we stand on sort of GDPR and whatnot these days? Uh, you, these days, uh, for example, that's why we lost access to our wave accounts yeah. because we were using, I was using my predecessor's uh, password. Yeah. Uh, they get, they really do either put in uh, protocols or they just suspend you and then you have to phone in. Yeah. And my predecessor was a female, so it's actually quite difficult for me to phone in. <laughs> <laughs> Because as much as I try to speak with us, I can't. Yeah. Um, if, if I'm away, people have access to, to my emails, and they're incredibly well protected because of all the, the, the data and all the, the stuff that I deal with. I think so long as you have a system where you knowingly give access to other people, I think that bypasses GDPR in some sense. Yeah. You know, you can have private emails, but then also if it's a work email and people need access, you know, yeah. at, the, at the magazine, we have about Fetford magazine and three of us have access to it. It's because it's business organization. Yeah. Okay, well, that's been, I'm glad that there's been sort of, you know, working our way backwards as well as forward. Um, and the one that was a uh, risk value of nine, I think it was the only one. Inadequate maintenance of council owned historical building. Council may have inadequate funds to finance the repairs required to bring into safe and usable condition. The scale of the essential restoration works at the Guildhall, £100,000, and St Peter's are a threat to the council's adequate level of reserve. St Peter's roof is still outstanding, and this was identified as urgent works in 2008. We move fast here. This is a public safety risk in respect of St Peter's. There is also a legal risk to not maintaining listed buildings. So the decision that we've taken in relation to the Guildhall um, addresses the, the first part. But the second part, St Peter's, is tied up with the Heritage Master Plan situation. So that will still appear on the uh, risk assessment because we're actually no further forward. Although there has been quite a you know, public safety risk is reduced in the sense of there's been quite a lot of work going on to deal with some of the immediate health and safety issues, hasn't there? It's, as far as I'm concerned, it's wind and water tight and relatively safe. It's just a shell, but... Um, I, I think the fact that we have that we've identified as a risk, it doesn't mean that we're not doing anything at all or mm. it's an indictment on us. It's just that we've understood the risk and we've actually valued it. And this is why dealing with St. Peter's in the medium, you know, short to medium term is actually quite fundamental. Otherwise, we are going to have some challenges at some stage. Mm. I'm just wondering if that one should be a nine. Uh, 4.9 is, oh, no, the other one. No, the, yeah, the high risk and high likelihood. So, you want, you want. 4.9 then. Oh, 4.9. Oh, it, yeah. is, it is a 9. It is a 9. I'm just wondering if that should be a lower score or not. I I would be reluctant to, to, to I think it, we need to focus on it, and I think we should be reporting back on, on that. So if the Heritage mm -hmm. Master Plan doesn't, isn't a funding source, I, there should still be emphasis on management to actually go find or look at other things <laughs> and try to assess what we can do to mitigate that risk. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Um, this is sort of a bit of a tangential point, probably. Um, it's, it says here the Heritage Master Plan is still in progress. I was led to believe it finished last October. Um, what is happening and what is going on? It's uh, the final reporting is still happening around the Heritage Master, Master Plan. It got extended uh, by um, historical lottery fund. Uh, they actually had a big system failure, uh, and so they extended all their projects to enable us to get all our final reporting and et cetera. So, do we, have, do we have an expected finish date? Uh, it's fairly short. Sorry? It is quite, it's, it's, I think it's in weeks rather than. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think I had end of March, is something I've heard. I don't know if I've made that, but I think that was something meant to me. Okay. And what does finished look like? <laughs> <laughs> It's a report. Wow. What happens? <laughs> if I was not allowed to take the test, I would bite that. That's me that does it. I, I, I don't know. I, okay. I, 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 I think that project needs, we need to take control of the ownership of it again at some stage. And I, it's just. 
Well, well, if I'm looking at a financial risk assessment that gives me the highest possible score of risk, and it's reliant on being resolved on the heritage master plan, quite important that we know what's going on. Yeah. Well, well is that the phase is true, it's my understanding. So, 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 the heritage master, this is the first part of it, when okay. there's a phase two of identifying projects, because if we don't identify any projects in St. Peter's, if they, they could take it to the next level, then we're in trouble, you know, we yeah. can come back to this. Yeah, it's at that stage, it's like that ridiculous meeting, that presentation, was identifying the projects. And we couldn't do that because we were sitting in here looking at some absurd presentation as opposed to going and... But there were no the things either. No, it was just... No, I don't... So, sorry to... No, please uh, My understanding is that that's sort of conceptual level. What, what gets a bit is conceptual, it then gets developed. For, there's another phase two, and then there's a phase three to it. So we're finishing phase one, is my understanding. The concept was like the the end of Station Road, a little road junction, which is absolutely nothing to what we want to do. Making that look pretty is not going to benefit the middle of Thetford, um, the, the, the Station Road junction. Um, we've, we've identified the main buildings, and we need to go out and talk to people. Sorry, Doug. Yeah. No, just because I don't know if it's absolute, uh, because, <laughs> you know, I kind of... I'm interested in this sort of stuff, but yeah. my understanding is the phase one comes and then we get a report, and yeah. then it's right, what do we want to do now? And that's when it should come back to us the decision uh, point. Now, exactly who and when we make that decision, I think still needs to be ironed out, and it, it's something that we probably need to decide which committee sort of leads it, etc. And I think there needs to be a, a clear structure on that. Phase two would then be identifying, okay, so we think um, St. Peter's Church and uh, encounter other priorities, and we, we sort of move, move on that, and then we ask. We'd need to, I believe, spend a bit of money, but then I think we'd have to be match funded with heritage fund, lottery funding as well. To go, okay, right now we can develop this plan in this direction a bit more specifically. That's when it theoretically gets drawn up with more costs. So to be honest, even if everything goes swimmingly with the heritage lottery fund, etc., uh, and the heritage master plan, it, it's not a solution to St Peter's Church in the next four years. It's, it's going to be one of those things. That's why I'm worried. That's, yeah, which is why you're right, Steve. Unless the level one changes the way it's structured. The way the funding is now is there is one project for the middle of Thetford. And that's the bit that I find quite strange. They want us to identify these four buildings or five buildings, whatever they are, and put one costume together for all those projects in one in one lump. And I find that incredible. It would be wonderful to say focus on St. Luke's Church, on the Guildford, or whatever, and then cost that up get an idea for it, develop it, and then go back to the next one in a few years' time. At the moment, they want one project, detailed costing, detailed everything, but a whole of the middle of Thetford. My understanding was that one, but that's the ideal end goal, but there's, they recognise as constituting building blocks of that, and that it's not all happening at once. And then the next stage is for us to prioritise it and say which one we want at that point. So that's it. Whether we do it that way or not is yeah. the other question, but that's at least the structure of what it's supposed to go. About. We need to sit down and actually develop it, do something. Yeah. Because we've been talking about this for a year already, well, no, 10 or 11 months already. And the, the, the funding bid was what, two years ago, three years ago, and we know further forward. And Terry, then, Carl, please. I think the heritage master plan is asked to do what we will with. It's that, it's that simple, isn't it? We don't have to abide by, you know, that is just a report. It's not a dictate. Mm. So we make it what we want. And I've, I've got some pretty firm ideas about what I want to do with it. Carla? Well, in a way, I have a question. Uh, so last time Tricol or Tricol or whatever you want to call it, consultants were here presented and we are at that crossroads that you mentioned where we could take things forward but we needed to come up with the projects to go inside the building to justify the use of the building fund, if I remember well. How far along since then have we come in, in, in reality? That's what I'm trying to get at, trying to understand exactly which point we are, to understand where we're we trying to go with this because there doesn't seem to be a direction at the moment but I don't know exactly where we're exactly where. So like trying to step and you don't know exactly where you're stepping because you don't know what's been done and what the next step is. I heard about three steps, but when and how is what I still don't know. No, no, I agree. Delta, do you want to come back? Uh, yeah, I can say on that one. It is, it is partly to do with this because we obviously want to keep players. I think mm. the Heritage Lottery, uh, the Heritage Master Plan 
was involved with different parties as well. So they have a stake in what they want yeah, to do yeah. as well. Um, whether we think that's a good thing or not, is you can, yes, you're right. It's what, yeah. it's what we do with, but just there's other people we need to sort of work with, which is why it's all yeah. a bit murky and very strange about the way it's been presented to us, I find. Um, 100%. Yeah. And um, Doug, so you mentioned stage two and stage three. Is your understanding that the uh, original funding envelope, the 250K, does that include stage two and stage three? I don't think so, but I don't know. That's my understanding. Is it doesn't um, yeah. So we've adopted a draft project budget earlier for the year ahead. Do, do you see where I'm getting at? So the, the Heritage Master Plan is integral to our financial risk assessment. It's actually really important to our project plan because if the stage two isn't funded, as I don't think it is, we've agreed a project's budget that doesn't allow any money to do stage two or stage three. So anyway, I'm, I'm sure you're really pleased you mentioned Heritage Master Plan in the financial risk assessment. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I, I do think it's my fault. Yeah. No, no, I do think it is related because it's the biggest score. Uh, there's two nines and it's the biggest score on here and it does relate to our reserves and our project budget and it's happening in isolation to those things and, and i think, no I think we're right to be, we're right to be concerned anyway sorry i'll uh, try and bring us back forward the only other one was the so we'll, we'll keep those scorings the same there's not a problem with that and the fire safety requirements not being met and you know we've correctly identified them and at least we're aware of the problem and we've obtained quotes and we're fairly on track. Yeah. Was there any other risks detailed within there that people wanted an update on or more information about? Doug? Right, it's one of the other um, star ones, and forgive me, is the city with child Yeah. centre. Um, and I do remember having a discussion about it at a previous meeting. As I think it says, oh, campus would be briefed um uh had briefing on it i'm just wanting to check is there any papers about that just so we've got that for records um yeah i'll get a number sorry i was clicking on to another no that's fine we were trying to quantify the risk on that particular yes. one weren't we? yeah. and in terms of the town council's liability yeah. and we i think we did get some legal advice didn't we I can't remember where we no, were. No, no, no. It, it took me a little while, quite a while to work out the methodology. So I was trying to work out how to do it. So it's just a matter of about doing it. Mm. it I, I spent about three three months every now and again thinking, well, if I had, if, uh, could I do it this way? Could I do it that way? So I think I can actually do it by just doing these values and projection of what, yeah. What, yeah. Went, what would need to happen <clears> for <throat> the defaults to, to occur. So, um, but. Probably about a day's work or something. But, um, Which for some reason you've not got a free day in the moment. Right. <laughs> cool. Um, no, that's fine. Just make, I just wanted to make sure I haven't missed anything. Like yeah, it's, it's in the action points. So take this case forward to that. Thanks. Everyone happy? Um, One question. Yep. Did we ever establish whether we are still insured against terrorist attack? Because that's not on <laughs> <laughs> We are still insured because our insurance uh, premium, still insured. Our insurance premium got Best frozen, and 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 yeah. we, if we change it, then we're going to pay a higher premium. So we just left everything as right. It. Terrorist attack isn't in the risk assessment, I don't think. Um, but, uh, let's be called by time. I'm to claim. <laughs> and didn't we establish a while ago the insurance stuff for renewal at some point? Uh, it's we thought it was it had to be renewed in June last year. Uh, it runs through for second year. And yeah. then it goes up with you. Okay, so we might want to revisit that point when we review the schedule. Uh, and it says to recommend the adoption of the finance risk assessment to full council. Uh, would somebody like to propose that we recommend that? Chris and seconder. David. I hope you're paying attention tonight, David, because you need to present these minutes and recommend because <laughs> I'm not going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But you're not there either. Not either. Oh, well, we need to, we need to keep it then. Annie's here. Annie's going to be here. Annie's going to be here. Do you want to send them, Annie? Yeah, that's fine. And uh, oh. Alan, I hope you're fine. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry. We have a child. That was your starring moment next oh, week. Oh, if you like, don't stay with the grandchildren and you can do the treatment. I'm going to talk out. Oh, yeah. You're going to Brooklyn, so. Uh, right, moving on to 766, review of the financial regulations. Finance heavy tonight, Alan. Unfortunately, this year in, that's yeah, it. right heavily gauged about the problem. So. But there are some quite useful um, proposals to amend financial regs. Are you happy to take us through them and we'll sort of sure. stop for comment on each one? Is that right? Sure. Uh, on item number one, the orders, we, we've spoken about that uh, earlier on, and I think it's really just a matter of making it more robust. I'm driving it at the SMT level, and I'm going to make sure that it happens. We've got templates being developed and processes, and I'm fairly certain that we will get, um, um, we'll be able to get the, the financial regulations to support a process that's actually relevant to to what we do from, um, from the budgetary control and spending perspective. The second one is 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 an issue Sorry, around just on the, the ordering. I assume everybody's happy with that one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To be honest, I'm amazed that doesn't happen already. We covered it earlier. Yeah. So brilliant. Yeah. Just wanted to make sure. The second point was really around authorizing commercial leases. And I've become very much aware of this because I get a, a, an email sent to me from, from our property agents and they'll say such and such is commuting in. Uh, these are the heads of terms, and are you happy or not? And I just thought that, that because of the nature of, of places like the shambles in particular, I think it would be very appropriate for there for, for, for the, for the, for to be council councillor oversight over that, or otherwise councillor has to council, this committee has to, which is responsible for the commercial leases, has to set out some framework for, 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 for us to operate, because I feel very naked, if I can use that term, uh, in making those decisions, uh, um, it is quite difficult. So, so we need a framework, or we can get some councillor oversight over it. So I would prefer to go to council oversight because I think we have to be a little bit more flexible. If some, if 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 our property agent gets approached to do something and it's not in the framework, then we've got a whole lot of delays. Whereas if we had another mechanism, we could actually um, do that. So that that's really what the proposal would be around that. Everyone happy with that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, we've seen the report, and uh, or some of us have seen the three of us, four of us have seen the report from the Stanford Trust, and we, we can't go on like that. We, we need a proper mechanism for doing this stuff. Well, I had a meeting with the clerk this morning, and she said she put that into the board papers. I said we do exactly the same thing. Good. Okay. The third item that, that I've suggested changing is just to entrench the role of the grants working group. We set up that grants working group. It's just to make sure that 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 that, that when we have grant or we report on grants, that we actually run through the uh, uh, that working group, and it's there, and it lives, and it's, it, it, it's effective, and it does what it's supposed to do. Um, I think we should make it a requirement in financial regs that uh, grants can't, um, uh, it's not grants so much, it's terms and conditions for grants can't be signed without council approval. Um, I'm not too worried about applying for grants um, because you're not bound to anything, but I do feel quite strongly that we've had situations where we've applied for grants and we've officers have signed to accept terms and conditions that councillors are completely unaware of. Ultimately, it's the councillors who are responsible as the council, um, and there should be some sort of uh, probably finance and personnel committee should sign to say that we're happy to accept those terms and conditions. I mean, lots, you know, lots of charities that I've been involved in, um, you know, the chief exec uh, has to get board approval to sign up to those terms and conditions because they're still live, even if those members and staff move on. So, David, um, up to a point, yes, mm. but depends on the size of the grant. Yeah. You know, if we, if we turn around and say, yeah, you know, above 5,000, whatever, but not not every grant, I don't think mm. that could be just a thought. We don't need to know about the small grants of 50 quid, 100 quid, yeah. 500 quid. I can't imagine we're applying for too many small grants. Well, no, but, but they are. They are going to be, there are going to be some yeah. small ones come yeah, in. Okay. I'm happy with the £5,000 figure. Yeah. That makes sense. If we don't meet the terms and conditions, pay the small one back. You happy with that? Happy. Okay, uh, four. 
forests, I also mentioned this, I, it's the bane of my life is that we don't have the hunting Absolutely. And what I've done is I've actually put a, a, a monetary amount in, and a committee would have to say, you don't appoint project managers rather than being the other way around. So if there's a project of more than 25,000 pounds, we have to appoint a, a project manager and this the committee approving the, 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 the order or the tender actually decides otherwise. That feels a pretty good insulation uh, against what happened with the towers and scaffolding, doesn't it? And it's happened us in other projects too. Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, item, item five is uh, we have, when we put our tender documentation, we put in a whole lot of requirements that none of the officers are really in a position to, to assess. So sometimes we ask for environmental information, we ask for health and safety. And where you know an IT contract to have an, an environmental uh, um, strategy, I'm not too sure is that relevant. I can understand that you know if you were doing waste management or something like that, that would be quite relevant. And I think it's really just a matter of saying making sure that the tender document supports what's actually being required, rather than just saying that well it's a checkbox we need to have this, this, and this, and this. So we put it in regardless of what the nature of the tender is. I think we've limited the number of contractors that have submitted tenders because we've asked for documents that a lot of firms don't have and they're not even relevant. Yeah. Why would we yeah. narrow the pool of people interested in doing work for us on the basis of documents that are not even relevant to the role? Yeah, no, that's, a, no, that's fine. Um, the only other thing I was going to ask, um, is there anything in any of the financial regs or any other documents that um, require contracts to be in place um, for successful tendering procedures. Do we have do we have, <laughs> do we have firms working for us that don't have contracts in place? Thank you. That has to stop, doesn't it? Oh, do well, what we've done surely. surely. What, if I can, probably, what we've done where possible is I've if, if I've been involved in that, for you said, for example, the IT contract that we renewed. Uh, uh, we actually, I put, they said this agreement, and I actually specified there that any conflict between this agreement and the tender document submitted, the tender document uh, uh, is, takes precedent. And I've actually, they've agreed to those. So, but in most cases, uh, we don't do any any contracts whatsoever. It's another thing I'll be keen on would be penalty clauses, if appropriate. Well, I think we should have a, um, a standard contract that should probably be included as maybe an appendices to um, financial rates, which includes key information. One of them is on obviously um, break clause, break KPIs clause and financial penalties. And I think actually we should standardise our contracts because yeah. one of the major issues we've had as a council is with contractors taking the mic. Frankly, um, yeah. councils are saying it's an easy touch, aren't they? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy if you want to adopt the rest decision, and come back at a later date with a list of mm -hmm. pick up the bill. contractual requirements. Is there, yeah, and, and the fallout of that. Is there such a thing as a list of pre approved suppliers from Breckland or anything like that? Breckland operates the pre approved so suppliers, but we access that. Or is that not viable? I, I don't think that we we have that much buying power uh, and I, we don't have enough of the same routine contracts. So yeah, it's insurance, IT, that would be about it. Yeah, ours are project specific, whereas Breckland is more routine. Um, that said, if it's over 25K, we do put it on the the uh, tender portal, don't we? And yeah. Firms can bid for it. Yeah, so they've got to pre qualify there anyway. Yeah. yeah. But I do think it should be a financial reg requir requirement that contracts are in place. Maybe it's because I wasn't in finance before. They actually assumed there was already a breakout clause and a remedy. Uh, and so clause included embedded into those contracts, particularly when they're, when they're, they're averaged above 25K, which is the highest essential amount in a contract. But if it's not there, I always to put it there because it's a safety net uh, yeah. and for us and for I've not sensed, they know what to count on. I've not sensed a lot of willingness from the council to address poor performance from contractors. And I think one of the reasons right. is because we don't have, it's like the conversation earlier about job descriptions. If you don't have a contract, what are the key terms in which we're engaging them? How do, what do we hold them to? If I understand well, I think it's the fear because there's not enough contractors out there for us to be 
picking and choosing about who we, you know, so there's not many people putting forth and burning themselves forward to the tenders. So sometimes we have to do it when the ones that come forward and just pick the best out of it, whatever we give them. But even so, I think embedding those 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 clauses in the contract doesn't take away from us going with those contracts. It's just to give us a certain night in situations where the contract is already let down or they give up mm -hmm. halfway or if they're not fulfilling their commitments, we pay for a service we're not getting. There's got to be some sort of remedy embedded into the contract. And I think that's a legal point. It should be addressed. Yeah, I'll give you a little for instance, the steps that are done behind the guild hall. Guy started work um, sort of before Christmas, after Christmas decided to go on holiday. <laughs> you can't, you can't yeah. be doing stuff like you can't right. be doing so stuff like with the terms contracts on occasions. And that is a very good example of why those clauses need to be there. On the long term, they will pay off by being there. Toilet cemetery opening. Oh dear, the Christmas. <laughs> the Christmas, <laughs> really my Christmas day. Well, of course, the Christmas <laughs> either. Yeah, no, when they feel like it. But those things can be prevented if people are aware there are consequences of the, the, the contract not being kept up to. Yeah. Um, sorry, Aaron, I'm creating some work for you. No, no, no. Um, sorry. Don't expect that to be straight okay. up. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got a reaction plan for next year's review, if you don't mind, because it's mm. so to do this year. Yeah. And I think uh, some of these contracts will resolve themselves. Toilet, for example, we're recruiting our own person, they'll be resolved through other ways. But if we're going to take any new contracts on, um, you need to get it right now, moving forward. So. But it was those flaws and uh, those missed points that led to us to find an alternative, because otherwise yeah. the contract was working well, we would never address and never hire another yeah. person. We would continue with the contract if that was working mm -hmm. out, which it wasn't. Uh, six. Regulation 20.1 <coughs> needs to permit the charity to appoint its own clerk and separate the town clerk from the charity. The regulation says that the the uh, um, council appoints the town clerk as up to the trust. So it's just to separate that out because we actually have changed that. Okay. Sorry, what charity? Standard before. All oh, right, okay. Any. Um, and I assume that also uh, would apply um, if the colony is put to a charity yeah i want to future proof that by amending that to say um any future charities that the council is the sole corporate trustee of that would cover that otherwise effectively the 18 councillors are voting on the appointment of a clerk for the charity and you've got no idea who it is anyone got any other points about financial regs have you all read them in detail? Intimately. Pop, pop quiz next month. <laughs> Skin bridge. Just for this particular session. Well, uh, they are a very good document. Anything else on financial aids? Are these a recognition, recommendation for council? This is a recommendation. I'll actually incorporate them into the financial aids and put it as a separate item on next week's full council. For Annie to present for council. Yes. <laughs> Ages. Uh, can I have a proposal to accept the new financial regs with those amendments, Chris and Seppinda? Ron, all in agreement? Thank you. 767 correspondence to note and consider any other correspondence. Uh, yesterday, today, I received a letter from the. the uh, Small audits, audit authority. I have to bring that to your attention. It's just setting up instructions for this coming year's audit. Nothing else. Okay. 768 action points. Just going to pick out any that are. Uh, it was touched on earlier. First one, Tep Town website is still being developed and policies are to be added to the website once the update has been completed. I might park that. So you've got a website on your agenda tomorrow? Yes, we have. Okay, so yeah, probably best not to go into that then. Uh, the finance officer to investigate the rates for the council chamber. This has now been investigated. The town council has been paying a disproportionate of the GW Stanley for charity business rates. Application is being made to have the business rate assessments revised. Has that progressed at all? I had a, 
a chance to spend two hours on it today, and I spoke to Agri Revenue Partnerships. Uh, they're happy to go back and revise all the rate assessments that I've undertaken to give them the information. I've written the paper on it for them. So I'm just emailing the information through tomorrow morning. Oh. And they will then start the process. I've got to link them up with uh, our property agents because they've got the exact dates and some of the agreements. And hopefully we should get a significant refund from Angry Revenue Partnership to the council. Hey. Because Happy I made a mistake. I thought GW Study Force was actually had been relieved of the responsibility for section of the council. Most of it will come back to the trust. Um, my significant might be different to your significant, but what's your significant? Uh, we've been paying about £12,000 a year, I'd say half of that is ours. So £6,000 from 2019 to now, I would classify this. That sounds like more participatory budgeting. <laughs> <laughs> So that sounds significant to me. So I'm happy with that. Back towards the results. Yes, quite. Um, thank you for doing the work on that, Alan. I think that's. I know that's been a job of work, sat waiting to be done. Um, the one that's probably relevant tonight: meter readings to be attained at the end of the financial year. So that's coming up, and that's what we're poised to do that. Do that. Planning training in person is being approved. Derek mentioned the word Weatherspoons. Competitive quotes on credit card to be obtained to be timed with the expiry of the rental of the current credit card. Please. When is the expiry period? I think there's a few more months to go. The problem we have is we have very cheap rental, rental agreements and, and slightly more expensive charges. Mm. Everyone else is offering very cheap charges, but very expensive rental agreements. So mm. I just have to be off cost of Okay. After 923 will be addressed in one month. Yeah. So first um, two towers we can take off because that has been done. The Act and Town Clerk to contact Job Centre Plus in respect of vacancies being been... Was that a useful process or? I'll let you know next week. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, actually. Yeah. Uh, the Act in Town Clerk to ensure that the draft project's budget be taken to committees for more detailed discussions, and that has also been done. Seven six nine community engagement. Um, we adopted quite a transformational budget, and um, and there hasn't been a single press release related to the budget. Um, and I'm slightly annoyed when I see people on Facebook saying, why is my town council council tax gone up by 9% and what am I getting for it? Which is a fair challenge. Um, so I suspect I should probably have to help the comms officer with some of the detail. But I would like to see some press releases related to what people are paying for. I mean, you know, we, are, we have charged more, but we are delivering more as a result. So, um, <laughs> well, I forgot to ask you for was your... Presentation to for council, but I think that's okay. that's that was my mistake. If I had that, I could have done something with it. Certainly, the decisions we took around apprenticeships and additional funding for uh, welfare support you know, are quite newsworthy, and those two things alone equate to the nine percent increase. So, let alone anything else. Thank you. I think it's worth, uh, rather than putting it in percentage points, putting it in real yeah, I numbers, because I think people look at 9%, oh, it's twice as much as Norfolk County, when it's only a tiny fraction of Norfolk County. 5% increase with Norfolk is about 60, 70 quid. Yeah. 9% increase to us is about an extra £12 a year. Yeah, so, yeah. That's a the problem with the percentages. It's also worth pointing out that the majority of people on benefits only pay 9%, in 9.1%. Well, it's only money. It's only twelve pounds for a band D. Yeah. So even if you're not on benefits, a band yeah. A to C is less than twelve pounds. Yeah. I think it's fourteen actually. From memory, I wouldn't get into that argument because a lot of people pay nothing. Breckland insist on that nine percent. Oh yeah, but that is. But that, sorry, yeah. but that is the figure. For, yeah. No, I, no, I, I agree. But so I think in cash terms, rather than nine percent, yes, I think that's. Brilliant idea, you know. Yeah, good point. It's clear for people to understand that yeah. in balance and perspective. Yeah, 9% seems a lot, you know, four quid is nothing. Mm. 
It's not nine percent of nothing is nothing. Four mm. percent yeah. of a lot is a lot. Mm. Yeah. Seven seven zero committee officers update anything. Exclusion of press and public to consider resolving that pursuant to the public body's admissions to meetings at 1960, the press and public be excluded for any remaining items of business on the grounds that publicity would be prejudicial to the public interest by reason of the confidential nature of the business to be discussed. The two remaining items relate to personnel issues. Are members happy to exclude press and public? Yes. yes. Which in this case means turning off the recording. Okay. <laughs> There's no present public to exclude. I just turn off the recording. <laughs>